thank you everyone for coming along. So as we all know, artificial intelligence is much in the news and it's hard to avoid some talk about it, either some wonderful new application or even uh, more likely some possible threat to human existence that artificial intelligence might pose. So all of that from the magic of text generation to music artificial intelligence like Ava, uh, which you can use to generate massive amounts of music copyright free to put on your TikTok video, all the way through to the sorts of algorithms that Google and uh, Meta use to mine their data. I won't be talking about that. Those are algorithms that write algorithms. And somebody has to program the machine, and then you give it massive amounts of data, and every time it makes a mistake, you correct it. That's the simplest kind. So the initial algorithm will write the algorithm that learns the function they are trying to simulate. What we're interested in, in particular, my colleagues at the uh, Australian Centre for Engineered Quantum Systems, is building learning machines. So machine learning, algorithms that write algorithms. I'll come back to this a few times. We're interested in machines that learn. Now, we're all very familiar with machines that learn. We are machines that learn. In fact, all mammals are machines that learn. Needs to say, we're not simply machines that learn. There's a bit more to it than that. But if you go right back down through the animal kingdom, uh, you can keep going down as far as you like, but let's go back this far to this learning machine, which is a nematode worm whose genome was sequenced 25 years ago. Virtually everything that's possible to know about an animal is known about this animal. It's one millimeter long. It's comprised of 900 cells, 300 of which are neurons. That's its brain. So one third of this animal is made up of neurons, which are the basic constituents of all mammalian brains or all ma mammalian learning machines. It was originally thought that it was simply something like a thermostat. If it got too hot, it moved away. If it got too cold, it found somewhere warm to sit. If it got too much salt, it would just move away. But over the last 30 years or so, it's become increasingly clear that this is a very sophisticated learning machine. It can respond to mechanical stimulation. It can become habituated to mechanical stimulation. It can learn through associative learning, and it can remember very specific aspects of environment, particularly where to find food and where to avoid threats. The most interesting thing about it is the neurons that make it up have been studied all the way through from genetic coding of proteins all the way through to how they actually turn on and off. And remarkably, these mechanisms, these molecular mechanisms, it's a little, little sort of machine of learning switches, those molecular mechanisms are conserved pretty much right through the animal kingdom all the way up to us. So if we can understand this learning machine, then we'll have some hope of understanding what happens in incredibly complex learning machines such as ourselves with billions upon billions of neurons. As Wong et al. pointed out, all the mechanisms of learning in it are conserved and very similar to what we've got in our own heads. So there are learning machines out there. We have a pretty good understanding of how they work. And so the objective in our program is to build artificial learning machines. However, you can already buy them to some extent, uh, the kind that you can train with data, the kind that Google and uh, Microsoft use. But you can buy one if you want. They're, they're a snip at 300,000 pounds. Not to worry, you can get some finance should, should you need it. Um, you can get much cheaper ones, I hasten to add, and of course they run up to hundreds of millions of dollars if you really are serious about it. Now, one of the aspects of contemporary machine learning of this algorithmic type, of algorithms that write algorithms, is it is unbelievably inefficient in its use of energy. So here's some numbers. If we look at, say, air travel for one person, New York to San Francisco, that will produce about 2,000 pounds of CO2. Uh, let's look at something a bit more significant here. Uh, a car, average usage including, including fuel over one lifetime, uh, 126,000 pounds. 
But let's go down to one of these natural language processing machines. The really big ones, like the transformer, which are used by uh, Microsoft and Google and others, you can see what the difference is. 620,000 pounds of CO2 for one training run. And then, of course, once it's trained, people want to use it to identify uh, patterns in data, and that will cost a lot of energy to run and thus produce a lot of CO2. So it isn't surprising that deep pockets like Microsoft and Meta, pretty much, and Amazon, of course, own this world because the power bills, not to mention the cost of actually building the machines and hiring the staff to program them, are enormous. Now, it's pretty clear that C. elegance isn't producing that much CO2, and yet it's still learning quite a lot about its world. So there is no fundamental reason why that should be the case. It's just because of the way we've settled on doing machine learning through algorithms that write algorithms. And one of the key points I'd like to uh, present to you today is that by changing that perspective and building machines that just learn, they won't necessarily be digital machines, there's nothing about C. elegans that's digital with little switches, building machines that learn will enable us to have vastly more efficient learning capability than we have at the moment through running algorithms on silicon-based devices. So let me just recap where we've got to. In deep learning, such as uh, used by Amazon Web Services, say, these are literally machines, just computers, silicon-based devices, typically graphical processing units, uh, but perhaps other more optimized devices, where algorithms write the algorithms. So the programmer will set up a basic algorithm to simulate what was thought to be the essential idea of a neuron. Then by giving it huge amounts of data, and I'll come to an example in a minute, the machine will reconfigure itself and discover an algorithm for capturing the pattern in that data. So that's the way deep learning works. They're algorithms that write algorithms. But what I'm talking about here are machines where thermodynamics write the algorithms. There is no programmer. The machine is embodied and lives in the world. Sure, you can send it signals carrying data, but as we'll come to later, it could be entirely robotic and move around the world and learn by itself. And the key point is that it's thermodynamics that writes the algorithms. And these will run on custom-built systems. What do I mean by thermodynamics writes the algorithms? It's really very simple. In order for a learning machine to function well in the world, it has to make the most efficient use of available resources, typically energy. Uh, if not, the environment may change and it will go extinct. So it's pretty clear why C. elegans is optimized to be as low power as possible. So we would like to build machines that function like that. So deep learning is machine learning. I'm talking about learning machines, physical devices. So let me just run through an example contrasting a machine that learns to an algorithm that learns. So one kind of machine learning is called supervised learning where you give lots and lots of examples of uh, data to a machine with a label. Here I've imagined we have silhouettes of sheep and goats. And in algorithmic machine learning, you would send in all the little pixels, black and white pixels of sheep and goats. And the way it would work is you would first train it on all the pixels that have goats and all the pixels that correspond to sheep. And every time the machine makes a mistake, you adjust it until finally it makes a very limited error. In this kind of machine, what we imagine is we literally have a physical device sitting here, and we put in pictures of sheep and goats. And initially, we just choose them completely at random, but they've got a little label on it. So we'll always know if it comes out with the right label at the end. So initially, they come out random. It has no way of knowing which is a sheep and which is a goat. But every time we make a mistake, we sit here at the output looking for an error. So here a goat has come out with a sheep label. We run back and change some setting inside the machine, this time a physical actual setting. It could be a chemical gradient. It could be an electrical pulse. It could be an optical signal, any kind. And gradually the machine will start to recognize what is a sheep and what is a goat. And eventually, with small probability of error, almost all the goat silhouettes will come out in one channel, and all the sheep will come out in the other. Now, if you think about what's happened here, initially we had this random assortment of data. 
But at the end, we haven't a random assortment of data at all. Apart from the few mistakes, basically, the sheep go to one side and the goats go to the other. And this means the machine has dramatically reduced the uncertainty in this data. The technical word is it's reduced its entropy. And if you have a device that reduces entropy, you pay a price. It will have to increase entropy somewhere out in the world. And in a physical machine, that means it will dissipate heat and energy into the external world. So the essential lesson that we have from these sorts of examples is that a physical learning machine is necessarily dissipative and produces heat. It's necessarily irreversible. So learning machines are only possible if the world is intrinsically irreversible, which I think most of us would agree it is, at least in our personal interactions with it. Key point. Secondly, in understanding in physics and thermodynamics, we know that if a device is reversible and produces heat, it will necessarily be accompanied by errors and mistakes and fluctuations. And you might think, well, that's no good. Uh, why build a machine that makes mistakes? Well, the key lesson is, if it doesn't make mistakes, it can't learn. Everybody knows this. It's called trial and error. Uh, if you don't make a mistake, you don't learn anything. Because it's on the mistakes that you start to feed back and change your behavior. And it's the same with these machines. They're irreversible, they produce heat, and they necessarily make mistakes in order to learn. Now, obviously, you don't want them to make too many mistakes and you don't want them to make no mistakes. Because if they make too many mistakes, it'll just keep producing random outputs of sheep and goats. If you can keep the error and the noise level as low as possible, it takes so long to learn because you're looking for those special cases where it makes a mistake to change the configuration of the machine. So there'll always be an optimal level of irreversibility and noise to optimize the learning rate. Now, in nature, of course, the learning rate is probably optimized by evolution. If C. elegans spent three days, well, actually, it only lives three days, so it couldn't spend three days, but if it, if it had to spend more than three days finding food, they would not still be around. So somewhere at the back of biological learning machines is the evolutionary algorithm. Nonetheless, we want to produce machines that are optimized to learn and optimized to produce the smallest amount of waste energy that we can manage. That's the key. Now let's imagine we take that kind of machine and we embed it in the world, such as us or C. elegans. But now we're actually going to build a device out of photons or mechanical devices or uh, electronics, doesn't really matter. I'll give an example in a minute of a quantum device. Uh, so the way it works is here's our learning machine, which I'll say a little bit more about in a minute. But it has a sensor which interacts with the world it physically changes its state when something from the world comes in. The world does work on it. It's necessarily dissipative because it's got to be a little switch. It's got to switch and say, aha, I detected a photon. It also has actuators which act irreversibly on the world. So these devices are also necessarily irreversible and produce heat. But we like to keep the heat cost as low as possible. Now, how does the machine learn? Well. All it has access to are its sensor records and its actuator records. All it knows is what actions it has taken and what sensations it has acquired. So all it knows of the world are correlations inherent between sensations and actions. And the purpose of the learning machine is to find a simple pattern in those correlations. Let me also add, it's a bit more than correlations because learning machines like this are intervening on the world. They're going out and poking the world in a particular way and waiting for it to respond. But you see, there's a curious puzzle here which philosophers have worried about for pretty much forever. And that is the machine learns correlations between its, sensuator, its sensor and actuator records. To what extent does that mean it's learned something about the world? I'll come back to that a little bit later. So here's a slightly more detailed picture of how the kind of learning machines we're building work, and in fact, how we work and how C. elegans work. One tends to think, when you're interacting with the world, that your brain is something like a video recorder. It's sitting there having all this data coming in. There's a 
vision recorder, there's a sound recorder, there's something recording vibrations and so on. As I'll explain in a minute, that's not really how it works at all. You'll see what happens when you take this design for a learning agent. So it pokes the world and the world pokes back. It then it simultaneously sends a copy of what it did to the world to its learning machine. And the learning machine now makes a prediction of what its sensation should be. It then checks its prediction against what's coming in from the world. And if they're right, it does nothing. If they're wrong, it goes back and changes some setting in the machine, just like the sheep and goats. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.